everyone. My name is Grace Beatty, and welcome to Wicked Women, the podcast. On this podcast, I will be discussing with leading experts some of history's most infamous and maligned women. Within each episode, I do not look to excuse or dispute the wrongs committed by some of these women, but I do strive to bring a more holistic and rounded understanding of each particular woman's story. Step back in time and come on this journey with me as we discover the lives and legacies of these fascinating women. In today's episode, I will be discussing Madame Restelle, Manhattan's most notorious abortionist. Discussing Madame Restelle's life and legacy with me today will be critically acclaimed novelist Kate Manning, who is the author of My Notorious Life, a fictional interpretation of Madame Restelle's life and world, and Jennifer Wright, an author and journalist who recently published the highly successful book Madame Restelle, The Life, Death, and Resurrection of Old New York's Most Fabulous, Fearless, and Infamous Abortionist. Keep listening to learn more. Content warning. In today's episode, we will be covering some sensitive topics, including abortion, miscarriage, childbirth, suicide, and abuse. Listener discretion is advised. She was known as the wickedest woman in New York during her lifetime. A physician adored by her patients, but despised by the moralizing populace sweeping mid-19th century America. She defied all social conventions of her era. She rose from an immigrant, widowed single mother living on the Lower East Side to a self-made millionaire outbidding the Catholic Diocese of New York for an empty lot on Fifth Avenue. She not only provided abortions and birth control to women throughout the country, but she blatantly advertised her services in New York newspapers. If she had been a man, she would have been celebrated for her American spirit. Unapologetically ambitious, a ruthless and savvy business owner, and a resilient survivor. But Madame Restelle was not a man. And in addition, she provided services such as abortion and birth control that still divide American society to this day. Instead of going down in the annals of American history, alongside men like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and J.P. Morgan, the name Madame Restelle has become synonymous with villainy, greed, murder, and corruption. Madame Restelle's life began with much humbler origins than her later persona would claim. Instead of being born in France and raised in the high-class medical world of Paris, Anne Trow was born in the Cotswolds region of England. Born in 1811, Anne's parents were neither wealthy nor doctors. Her father and mother were laborers at a local wool mill, and at the age of 15, Anne was sent to work as a maid for the local butcher's family. A year later, Anne left service to marry a tailor named Henry Somers. Henry turned out to be a drunk, with a tendency to gamble their money away. So Anne began taking on most of his sewing and tailoring. It was in this struggling household that Anne's only child, a daughter named Caroline, was born. In 1831, Anne, Henry, and Caroline left England behind to emigrate to America. They were three of 600,000 just in the decade of the 1830s, entering America for safety opportunity, and their shot at the American dream. Anne and Henry's tailoring trade did not get them far in the Lower East Side of New York City. By 1845, it was estimated that over 50,000 women worked in New York City either in garment factories or as seamstresses. This number would only continue to rise through the 19th century. The young family initially moved into the notorious Five Points neighborhood in Lower Manhattan, known for its crime, prostitution, gangs, and regular epidemics of cholera. By the 1840s, it was estimated that the streets of New York were populated by 30,000 homeless children and 10,000 prostitutes. 
Women working in factories worked 16-hour days with a salary of no more than $1.25 a week. And if a woman or family could not care for a child, their other option of an orphan asylum had a 90% infant death rate. In all likelihood, this would have been a reality Anne was all too aware of in Five Points. She would have witnessed firsthand the realities and desperation of poverty and the tragic consequences for both women and children if unexpected or unwanted pregnancies occurred. As Jennifer Wright emphasizes, she uh, came to New York in the hopes of making a great fortune. Her first husband died almost as soon as she got there, and she was left to raise her toddler by herself. And she very quickly, kind of by looking around the Lower East Side, saw that there was a real problem if women were pregnant and they did not want to be. And that probably led to her focusing on birth control when she learned how to compound pills together. Madame Restell moved to the Lower East Side with her first husband. He died quickly. She tried to make a living as a seamstress, but she really wasn't able to make enough money doing that. It seems very likely that with a child, she wouldn't have been able to work as a servant. And working at a factory meant 16-hour days. And as a result of that, a lot of poorer women drugged their children with laudanum, so their children would sleep while they were out at work. Laudanum became known as the poor child's nurse. And um, there, there are some real horror stories about this. The one that disturbed me the most from the newspapers was a mother who had a four-year-old and a new baby, and she had to go off and work in the factory. And she told the four-year-old, okay, look look after the baby while I'm gone. And she came back and the four-year-old very proudly told her that the baby had cried, but they got him to stop crying. And when she went in to see how that was possible, she realized that the way they got him to stop crying was by beating him over the head with a hammer. So uh, this is a nightmarish situation for women to be in. They cannot afford childcare or help. There is no social safety net. Um, having an unplanned pregnancy can destroy you. And a lot of women obviously resorted to prostitution. And in some cases, that was a good life for women. But those cases really were few and far between. Um, the average life expectancy for a prostitute would be about five years because it was a very dangerous profession. And it was a profession where you were very, very likely to get a sexually transmitted disease. So... Um, so not a lot of great options if you had an online pregnancy. And as Madame Ristel was considering what her options were, she was very lucky. She lived on the same street as a pill compounder named Dr. Evans, who I think um, produced some sort of abortion-inducing pills. But seemingly Madame Ristel started producing amazing abortion-inducing pills. And we know that she was using turpentine and tansy oil, which are very, very dangerous. You should never take them now. Um, people still do. In the 1970s, doctors said that turpentine was a kind of harrowing motif in do-it-yourself abortions. And there is a very recent New York Times magazine article about a woman trying to induce her own abortion drinking tansy tea while writing letters to her loved ones in case the tea kills her. So um, it it's awful. Um, it's still bad, but especially bad back then. And the most remarkable thing is that Madame Ristel was mixing these ingredients in ways that were not killing people. She started having customers that said, I'm coming back because I've already had five abortions using these. They are great. So Madame Ristel quickly established a kind of word of mouth clientele in her neighborhood. And it was doing very, very well. And around that time, she met her husband, Charles Lohman, who was a free thinker, and he was a printer at the New York Herald. And as somebody involved in the world of newspapers, he saw the sort of bombastic personalities that people advertised under. And uh, they started crafting one for Anne, where instead of saying, okay, I'm a British immigrant, we're really poor, <laughs> like everybody's trying their best. <laughs> um, they said that she was French, her name was Madame Restelle, and French people were considered very sexually sophisticated, that she had trained in Paris, her grandmother had been a famous midwife there. 
And it was a persona that made not only lower class people, but also upper class people much more comfortable with the idea of visiting Madame Restelle. So word quickly caught on among the upper classes in New York, who she could charge $100 for a single abortion. Um, of course, her enormous amount of advertising also led her to make some enemies who she quickly began fighting with in the press. The newly christened Madame Restelle was not revolutionary in her remedies for unwanted pregnancies. As Jennifer argues, I think one of the myths that has been kind of successfully spread is that abortion is somehow a new thing and it's a product of a decadent modern society. And of course that's not true. What you find when you start researching it is that abortion goes back as far as recorded human history. You can find reports about it in ancient Egypt, ancient Persia, Greece, Rome. There's never been a society where women haven't had abortions. And I was especially interested to, to know that it wasn't criminalized in America until the 19th century. So when Madame Restelle began performing abortions, it had just been lightly criminalized, um, performing an abortion before the quickening, which is when a woman feels the fetus moving inside her, usually around five months, was considered a misdemeanor. And it would be punishable with uh, a fine most of the time, never more than a year in jail. And Madame Restelle was making a huge amount of money. Most of the abortionists were. A fine wasn't really a big deterrent of when the fine would probably be something like $100 and you were charging $100 for an abortion. So, um, so it was something that when Madame Restelle began was sort of winked at by law enforcement and of course by the end of Madame Restelle's life in the 1870s it was illegal to even write about birth control and send that anywhere it had become an unspeakable crime and I think it's such an interesting period because it parallels what we're seeing today where we like to think that rights we have are never taken away from us, but of course they can be. Things can go backwards. Uh, the arc of history might bend towards justice, but it doesn't bend there in one straight line. It dips back a lot of the time, and I think we're experiencing one of those periods right now. And look, I know there are times when... I'm talking about subjects from this period that maybe don't relate directly to Madame Restell, but they relate to the world that Madame Restell was in, which so closely parallels ours. I remember during the murder of the prostitute Helen Jewett, who was sort of the premier high-class call girl of the day until she was beaten to death by one of her clients. The client's defense was that he was a man who had just turned 19 and he had such brilliant prospects. And even though all of the other women in the brothel confirmed that, yeah, he was definitely Helen's client, he definitely beat her to death, uh, the jury let him go because he was a promising young man. It's the same kind of misogyny that we really still have to deal with today. Madame Restelle sold a powder, tonic, and pill form of her remedy for $1 to $5, depending on which form you purchased. But she also made her product available to the poorest women in the city. Here is Kate Manning. She treated all women of New York. She treated, she, she had one ad in which she said, you know, medicines, $4. To the, to the poor, $2. To the very poor, gratis, meaning free. Um, and so it, it does seem to indicate that she wasn't just mercenary. She had a philosophy. She was trying to... Do, to help women. And so, you know, I think that she also, you know, the male medical establishment had not gotten involved in the, in the, in women's medicine. That was the province of midwives. That was the province of women. Um, and so if, uh, you know, women bleed all the time <laughs> and who was to say why she was bleeding? She certainly wasn't going to say if she'd had a miscarriage or if she'd had an abortion or if she'd been to see Madame Restel or many of the other. There, she, Restel was not the only one offering this service in the city at that time. So um, because the laws didn't outlaw it, 
she she practiced for quite a while and um, became quite wealthy and built a huge mansion on Fifth Avenue that was so grand um, and didn't apologize for it right next to St. Patrick's Cathedral, just about. <laughs> sort of as a thumb of the, to the nose of the church, which had said, you know, what an evil hag of misery, which is one of my favorite expressions. She was a hag of misery. <laughs> Madame Restelle quickly rose to prominence in New York's Lower East Side and began attracting attention from all of New York society. There are many aspects to this meteoric rise. In one sense, the blatant advertising brought her to the attention of supporters and quickly increased her number of enemies. As Kate discusses, if you read some of her, there are very there's very little written in her voice, but if you find it, you you see that she had a very com she had a combative streak. She seems to have had a good sense of humor. And so, you know, you, I did find one letter uh, written that she wrote to the editor of a newspaper saying, Can I, I just, can I, can't I just drive my carriage around in the park for, a, for an afternoon without being uh, pelted with insult and innuendo? She, she, she may have been quite grandiose. She published these advertisements in the newspaper, which, like many newspapers in, in, uh, of yore, the, the language is wonderful. And that's the other thing that attracted me to it. So she, her ads said, um, uh, lunar tablets for the relief of female complaint, not to be used when asterisk, because asterisk might result. <laughs> and so, so these were these were French lunar pills, or they were, and, and asterisks were commonly understood by women reading these petting papers, you know, not to be used when pregnant because miscarriage might result. So these t medicines that she was uh, she was hot, you know, heart, um, selling in the in the backs of many papers were remedies like ergot which is still used, ergotamine is a substance still used to induce labor. It, it's a fungus grown on grain. And women noticed that if cows ate this corrupted grain, they would miscarry their calves. And so from time immemorial, they kind of said, well, I'll have some of that <laughs> right now. So these medicines weren't perfect. They didn't work all the time. Um, but, you know, she styled herself as a French madame or a female physician, a French female physician, because there was a lot of Francophilia going on. Euro people really thought anything from Europe was better. But I, I was really drawn to her, her sass and her spunk, spunk and she, spunkiness. And she didn't, she, she seemed to evade the law for a long time because, Abortion was legal um, up until quickening, until a woman could feel a, a fetus moving in her body. And so really abortion was probably the most common form of birth control for, for, century, for, you know, for centuries. I mean, the, these 19th century ads in these penny papers for these tablets and these services probably were the first published information you could get about birth control. And I think that in the past, if you wanted to know uh, about an, getting an abortion or how to stop, I mean, the, ha stop a pregnancy, you had to go over the back fence or you had to talk to your, in confidence to your neighbor, or your great grandfather, great grandmother, <laughs> um, not grandfather. Uh, but so to see these ads, that's, that's part of what drew the attention and ire of, of the Comstocks and the religious uh, conservatives, um, there wasn't a written, there, there wasn't written information that women could go to. You were all on your own. It was just what your mom told you or didn't tell you. You know, you, when you look at the birth rates, I think in the beginning of the 1800s, the live women had the live birth rate for women was something like, I don't know, eight live births per woman. But by the end of the 1800s, it was four. So women were learning, they were figuring out how to control the size of their families and to 
limit it. And when you think about it, when you when you you draw a line between thirty thousand homeless kids on the street, and you know, and and not having access to birth control and abortion, and then suddenly having access to it, you 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 think, okay, these things are related. But aside from her advertising ability, a fact loomed larger than any advertisement. She had an incredible survival rate. Here's Jennifer. She was seemingly better at it. We uh, were all people really wanted to catch her having killed a patient. There is no record of her losing any patient. And that's remarkable at the time. Uh, She was on trial twice. But one of the women that she was on trial regarding actually died of consumption which is a respiratory disease spread by coughing. So unless Madame Restelle coughed on her while doing the abortion, she did not cause that woman's consumption. And the other woman she was on trial for, she performed a post-quickening abortion on that woman at six months. So she was sent to prison for it, but uh, the woman survived. Uh, She had syphilis, so she was sick independently. But again, not because of the abortion Madame Restelle performed. It had an amazing survival rate. Um, now, it, it was it was amazing for somebody who was untrained. One physician at the time estimated that among abortions, there was only about one death in a thousand if they were performed by a competent practitioner. I, I, I don't like to argue with the few statistics we have from that time. I would be surprised by that because Madame Restelle was doing these surgical abortions with a sharpened piece of whale bone. And if your hand slips, you can puncture a woman's bladder really easily. Um, There are a lot of ways that can go wrong. So uh, um, again, I I think he's talking about it in terms of if you had a well-trained person doing it, there were a lot of badly trained people who were trying to do it on themselves or trying to do it because they thought it was a way to make as much money as Madame Restell had made. But taking that into account, if women were delivered of a child by a midwife during this period, the death rate was about 1 in 200. And if they were delivered by a doctor, it was about 10 to 20 times higher than that. So uh, um, based on the very slim number of statistics we have, Abortion was probably about as safe as giving birth during this period. (laughs) Incredibly high, especially among doctors, because first of all, to become a doctor, you really only needed to spend about six months going to classes in America. Um, A a physician would rent out a lecture hall, uh, send out advertisements to, say, shop clerks, saying, okay, pay $50 and take these classes and you'll be a doctor at the end. They could graduate without ever seeing a sick person. Um, They certainly would never see a pregnant woman. And if they were inspecting pregnant women afterwards, they were expected to inspect those women fully closed and with their eyes averted. So midwives had a pretty sensational advantage just insofar as many of them had been pregnant themselves. Many of them knew how the female body worked. Uh, They knew what you should be looking for during a pregnancy, what was normal, what wasn't. And doctors did not do that. And there was an extra problem insofar as, and Igna Semmelweis gets into this, The mortality rate could be much higher with doctors because they would have just gone from, say, operating on somebody or handling a corpse to plunging their filthy hands directly into a woman's birth canal. And Ignaz Semmelweis realized that if they started washing their hands, the mortality rate would drop to be about on par with midwives. And his findings were rejected. And Charles Miggs said that it was insulting because doctors are gentlemen and gentlemen's hands are clean. Madame Restelle's vocal enemies far outweighed her vocal supporters, and she was constantly villainized in the press. As Kate points out, Oh, during her lifetime, she was excoriated. She was portrayed as, you know, a a devil woman. Uh, There were protests outside her house. She, you know, mobs would gather outside her house downtown and throw bricks at her window. Uh, and she moved uptown and people scattered. They didn't, they didn't want, they thought she would drive down real estate prices to have her 
<laughs> they criticize her tacky window shades. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, she was pretty much uh, the subject of of uh, scandal and was arrested a couple of times and probably paid off police officers to um, look the other way. She was uh, she was put out on Blackwell's Island, a jail. She was jailed for a number of maybe a year or two. Uh, Blackwell's Island is now Roosevelt Island. But she was put in the prison there and was thought to have a fairly a, a relatively comfortable time there because she had money and could have a better cell than some of the other women, but also she took care of them. <laughs> so in other corners, her services destroyed the fundamental role women had in the world to procreate, but also created a fear of wives infidelity and would as journalist Samuel Jank Smith stated, make marriage a mere farce. These appear to be the earliest religious arguments against abortion and birth control, not necessarily the concept of fetal autonomy. As Jennifer discusses, It had been more of a religious argument insofar as it would enable adultery. That the initial objections to Madame Restell aren't the idea of fetal personhood. They're the idea that... Okay, what if you're a married man and you go away on a six-month trip? Um, right now, your wife knows that she can't cheat on you because she might get pregnant and it would be a huge scandal when you came back. But now with Madame Restelle, your wife could be having an affair with a different man every single day and nobody would ever know. And this was very, very threatening to men. And Madame Restelle mounts an argument in the press that I think is very logical, which is... Men, do you think all your wives would become prostitutes if if they had the opportunity? Uh, and, and the implication is kind of like, well, if your wife loves you, she won't cheat on you. So maybe you should work on your marriage, go to therapy. Um, but but unfortunately, many men at the time did believe their wives would become prostitutes if they had the opportunity. There's this huge fear as people have moved to the cities that suddenly women have so much interaction with just admiring men in the course of a day. They could just be riding a streetcar with someone or going for a walk on the street and find themselves walking along a handsome man. And in that case, what is to stop them from just going off and having an affair? There are also a lot of misconceptions about how... Um, how sexual women are, there's a thought at the time that if a woman has a speculum inserted into her, she might become a habitual prostitute because she'll just love the penetration so much that she, she can't get enough of it. Which, if, if you've ever been to a gynecologist, like, the speculum is not a fun thing to have inserted into you. But, uh, yes, um, in a lot of the trials, they talk about how this woman Madame Restelle was operating on was having sex not every day, not every hour, but every five minutes with a different man. That's not possible. Um, it's still, it's still, I think, an argument that is used that if a woman needs an abortion, she must be a slut. She must be having sex all the time. And of course, that's not true. A lot of women who have abortions are married. They already have children. They don't want to have more children. Um, they're doing it for economic reasons or reasons regarding their ability to work. So uh, the uh, abortion turns women into sluts argument has been there for a very long time. And um, Madame Restelle's reasonable response of like, well, like a woman probably won't cheat on you if she loves you. So just have a loving marriage, I guess, was not effective at that time. <laughs> I think, I think part of it is also the idea that um, f why would a woman love them in this situation, which is very sad. The other, you still see that argument among like incel message boards today of like women are incapable of love. And of course that's not true. Um, but if you are someone who thinks like, okay, like, this woman is my piece of property, and she has to do what I say. Yeah, maybe if you look at that from that perspective, like, it's 
it's not natural to love somebody who regards you as a piece of property. I think if you were a man and you were thinking of it in terms of like, this is a servant who is constantly trying to escape my control, then yeah, you're, you're right. She probably, you know, would enjoy being with a different person who sees her as a person. The voices of dissent seemed to have no impact on Madame Restelle's success. By 1840, she was the most recognizable and successful abortionist in New York City. In 1845, the Buffalo Morning Express estimated her individual wealth to be upwards of $200,000, around $6.4 million today. This didn't remove her from the world or influence of men, however. Most of her greatest detractors were men, but her success is also due in part to the support of her second husband. Here's Jennifer. It's really impossible to read newspapers from this period without coming across Madame Rostel, because she mounts such an impassioned defense of her work. There are a lot of abortionists from this period, but most of them are kind of operating in the shadows. Um, you have to read between the lines in a lot of ads, where a lot of the ads will talk about how if you're experiencing an interruption of flow in your menses, they have something that can help regulate your period. And that means... Like, they can produce an abortion, but Madame Restell is the one who is writing these long opinion pieces likening abortion and birth control to a lightning rod that is going to avert the worst ravages of nature. And she's running these pieces on Christmas Day. I think that is bold by modern standards and incredibly bold at the time. I think that has as much to do with the fact that she was a woman with a profession as that she was a woman who happened to be performing abortions. It was still a time when I think many people were threatened by the idea that you could be a woman and you could independently be making enough money to drive this beautiful carriage around the city. One thing that I find is the universal link between Every successful woman up until about the past 20 years is they have an incredibly supportive husband. Um, it's true across both sides of the political spectrum. If you look at people like Margaret Thatcher, she had a husband who said that he would go wherever she found work. And uh, I think that is definitely true in Madame Restell's case, that she had a husband who was very supportive of his wife's enterprise and who probably helped her craft the persona of Madame Restelle. I think reception towards her husband is a lot warmer. Um, and uh, now her husband also advertised under the name Dr. Morisot. Um, he could distribute the birth control pills that Madame Restelle was compounding. But we do know that Madame Restelle actually did the surgery. So if a woman came to him and needed a surgery, he just sent her over to Madame Restelle. And uh, the press doesn't really talk badly about him. The press talks about, how, like, he's a jolly chap. Um, a real free thinker. Like, uh, just, just a fun guy. Um, so... Partly that might have been um, because he was a man. Partly that might have been because he did have a very different demeanor. He was known to be like a jolly, outgoing person who uh, probably was a, a little friendlier to people than Madame Restelle. Um, Madame Restelle really loved insulting idiots. So that, um, that makes her a prickly person in general, and especially coming from a woman, I think that really infuriates people. Um, but yes, I think it would have been a little different if she had been a man. But if she had been a man, she probably would not have known how to do this. When we look at some of the male abortionists from this period, we are looking at them because they just killed someone in an incredibly brutal and horrifying way. Abortionists were not only surviving in society, they were thriving. And Madame Restelle was leading the pack. Birth control was being distributed by men and women alike around the city and the country. And with rapid urbanization, the desire to limit family size was only increasing. Here's Jennifer. I always found it very interesting that Madame Restelle has this very close relationship with her daughter and her grandchildren, but she only has one child. And I think it speaks to the fact that 
she probably personally made a decision to limit the size of her family. It's becoming less rare, though. And uh, I think it's interesting that at the beginning of the 1800s, the average woman would be having about 10 children. And by 1900, the average woman only had three children in America. And in a time before really reliable birth control, a lot of that is down to people having abortions. And a lot of the reason for that is also urbanization in this country. If you have 10 children on a farm, Farming is hard. Like, th this is not idealized farming in any way. But you want a lot of hands on that farm. Uh, put children to work as early as three, doing basic tasks on your farm. If you move to a city, which has a lot of advantages, just in terms of seeing other people, in terms of society and culture and uh, recreational activities, you are suddenly living in a much smaller space. Um, having 10 children, if you are in a one bedroom apartment is unbearable. And uh, that was the time when children really went from being an asset if you live on a farm to being a deficit for a long time if you live in the city. And uh, that was a major factor in people deciding, okay, we're going to have smaller families now. People may have had more children in large part that was because uh, birth control methods were ineffective but there has frankly never been a time when women were really excited about having 10 children and uh, that I, I mean some women are that's if you want to have 10 children you you should do it that sounds so busy that sounds I was like, so much must be going on all the time. You must be so tired. But congratulations, that's great. Um, um, uh, but many people do prefer to have slightly smaller families. And uh, you see uh, people in history uh, um, being quite content with fewer children. And the time that children also become really valued is during this period where people do start having fewer families. Um, there is a quote from Montaigne in the 1600s that I think it's the 1600s, pretty sure. I'm afraid I'm wrong. You should check when Montaigne's alive. <laughs> yeah. um, but he says that uh, um, he lost two or three children in infancy, not without sadness, but without great mourning. Um, and uh, it was taken so much for granted during that period that, like, let's not get really attached to the baby until they're at least two, because, like, this is a very 50-50, are they actually going to survive thing. So uh, people were uh, more indifferent than we're used to seeing people be with babies. Um up until the survival rate really improves. By the start of the 1860s, Madame Restelle decided to build a mansion on Fifth Avenue to truly exhibit her success. She owned a plot of land on the corner of 52nd Street and Fifth Avenue, relatively rural by New York standards at that time. By the end of the century, this area would be known as Millionaire's Row, but Madame Restelle did not buy the lot with a sense of foresight, but for a much simpler reason hilariously petty revenge. Madame Rustel had a very personal and ongoing squabble with the Catholic Diocese of New York. The then Archbishop John Joseph Hughes was one of her most vocal detractors and is one of the men responsible for moving St. Patrick's Cathedral from the Lower East Side up to Fifth Avenue. Archbishop John intended to buy a nice plot of land across from the new cathedral for a rectory this is where Madame Restelle enters the scene, in a moment of perfectly timed revenge. Madame Restelle outbid the Catholic Church and bought the land intended for the rectory. She then built a three-story mansion with a clinic of such magnitude that parishioners and clergy could not miss it every time they went to church. Life seemed to be reaching a high for Madame Restelle. Her business continued to thrive, she traveled to Europe regularly, she was bedecked in diamonds, and the parties she threw on Fifth Avenue were always well attended. But there was a man about to enter that would rip Madame Restelle's world apart. That man was Anthony Comstock. Anthony Comstock is a complicated figure, derided by his peers, but incredibly effective politically. Originally, he would not have appeared any different than previous men 
who tried to bring Madame Ristel down. Here's Jennifer. Anthony Comstock's mother died in childbirth, and uh, some of his enemies said, uh, what a world of misery could have been saved us if only Anthony Comstock mothers had known how to use a syringe, um, which would have been one of the methods for birth control during the time. But yes, Anthony Comstock really worshipped his mother. She was devoutly religious. He grew up on a farm with an intensely religious background. Um, and he really seemed to feel that in dying, giving birth to her 10th child, his mother had filled her purpose as an angelic woman. And it's probably one of the reasons that Madame Ristel was such a target in Anthony Comstock's eyes, that... Uh, she was taking women away from their Christian destiny. He had a lot of help leading up to leading up to his time. Um, and part of that help came from Horatio Storer, who uh, really injected the fear of a great replacement into this discussion. Horatio Storer led the physician's crusade against abortion for the American Medical Association. And he was the one who said that from the moment of conception, this is a potential male or a future young man. And uh, that at that point, a woman should be nothing more than a kindly nest for the fetus. Now, I think if you've been pregnant and had a child, um, I have been, like, you know that your health and the fetuses are really inextricably linked during that time. Um, you do not get to detach and just feel like, well, I will go about my day and uh, this will just flowed in like a pink cloud, totally disconnected from me. Um, being pregnant and uh, giving birth has a great impact on your health and well-being. But uh, Horatio Storer did not see it that way. And uh, he was also very, very, very afraid of the influx of Irish immigrants and newly freed Black people after the Civil War. So Horatio Storer has a quote about how on it's implied white Protestant women's loins depends the destiny of the nation. Will it be filled with our children or those of aliens? And, um, and what he really wanted to do was deter white upper-class Protestant women from having abortions who were understandably as they tried to limit the sizes of their families having a lot of abortions. So uh, Storer kind of paved the way for abortion to be seen as a very bad thing by the time Anthony Comstock comes along. And Anthony Comstock was intensely religious. Um, he was also, and this always feels like a bit of gossip, except I think it's important in his case, a chronic masturbator who felt so guilty about it. And I think most people who feel guilty about masturbating either stop doing it or just like come to terms with it and accept that like everybody does it, it's fine. Um, Anthony Comstock really wanted to create a world where nothing would arouse his lustful impulses. So... Uh, um, he was in the army during the Civil War. He was appalled by the amount of pornography that other soldiers read. He was also very upset by the drinking. Um, soldiers got a weekly liquor ration when they were in the army. And uh, not everybody did drink it, but uh, the typical thing would be if you did not drink, you would give your liquor ration to like, someone who was having a bad week. Anthony Comstock poured out his bottle of liquor in front of everybody while lecturing them on how evil alcohol was. And the other soldiers responded by um, putting all of their garbage in his bunk. His uh, uh, diary from the time says that there seems to be a strong feeling of hatred for me among the boys. <laughs> Which like, yeah, yeah, of course there is. <laughs> so Anthony Comstock moved to New York and got work as a clerk in a dry goods store where one of his fellow clerks showed him a pornographic book and said that that book gave him an STD. There's a lot of debate about like whether he was poorly informed about how you get an STD or if he was trying to hide the fact that he was sleeping with prostitutes. I personally think he was probably um, making fun of Anthony Comstock. <laughs> I think he was playing a joke on him. But Anthony Comstock started buying up pornographic books and then going to the police station and leading the police back to the pornographers and telling them to arrest them. And uh, he um, became pretty well known for this. The early reports talk about how um, 
they don't like to mention him for the same reason they don't mention last year's flies. He's annoying, but he's unimportant. <laughs> so he was not loved at the beginning, but uh, he eventually got the support of Morris Jessup, who was the head of the YMCA, which was an organization where young men were supposed to be able to come from the country and have a Christian life without falling prey to the influences of the big city. So these two were very simpatico, and Anthony Comstock started rallying more support and also more funds to allow him to expose pornographers during this period. And in 1875, he got the Comstock Act passed, which forbade the mailing of any obscene materials through the mail. Well, what's obscene, it's anything that Anthony Comstock finds obscene. So it can be pictures, it can be books, it certainly would be any descriptions of how to have an abortion or any medication that could induce an abortion. And uh, the Comstock Act, um, understandably, has fallen into disfavor except they are trying to resurrect it because people today send abortive medications like mefesprazone through the mail. So uh, one way they are trying to stop that is by invoking the Comstock Act. Comstock's rise did little initially to Madame Restel's business. She continued to provide her services, but then a man arrived at her door asking for a solution for a pregnant friend. As Kate tells it. So Anthony Comstock was what he called himself a, a, a weeder in God's garden. He um, was extremely, he was a congregationalist from Connecticut who was against drinking and dancing and, and um, chastised the soldiers that he served with in the Civil War for, for chewing tobacco. He would, you know, he, he was a killjoy and a, and a prude of a man. And, and always, were you know, sin was on his mind like a hat, as they say. There's a book about him, which I recommend, called The Man Who Hated Women. And this is a, an account of all the women that he pursued. He figured out a way to write a law that would pass, that would be constitutional. And these are called the Comstock Laws. So the U.S. mail was used in this way. And once again, people in 2024, 23, are trying to use those Comstock laws to prevent women from securing uh, abortion pills like misoprostol and mifeprestol. So the Comstock law is not dead. Um, what he did was he, he would go, he, he got himself appointed as a postal inspector. So he would go around and he arrested newspaper editors uh, teachers, doctors, midwives, tobacco, tobacconists who sold postcards that he thought were dirty postcards. Um, he, he raided the Arts Students League because they had a nude model. He, he probably is responsible for 4,000 arrests. Some people died in prison because, you know, editors were, were made gravely ill by spending time in prison because of him. And he probably burned, I don't know, 5,000 pounds of books. I don't know. I have it here somewhere. But he was, you know, he would he would raid these, these establishments and swoop in. And he was, he was mocked because he still hadn't got Madame Restel. And uh, so one day he... He went in the guise of being a husband who wanted to help his little wife. She had almost died in childbirth. And could you help me, madam? Do you have anything? Yes, she said. And she, she gave him some medicine and a syringe, of uh, what was called a female syringe. And she said, you could use this also for watering your plants. <laughs> and uh, he came back uh, several days later not only with two policemen, but with a newspaper reporter or two, so that they could witness him arresting Madame in the company of several hysterical women who felt that their reputations would now be completely destroyed. And at this point, she became, she was probably in her 60s, maybe 70 at that point. 
And she was very upset because she could see the tide was turning, the laws were changing, and Comstock was um, getting more power. And she was due to go to trial. She was afraid she'd go to jail again. And um, really, quite dramatically and sadly, uh, on the morning of her trial, she climbed into this opulent marble bathtub of hers in her Fifth Avenue mansion and cut her own throat. And, um, you know, the newspapers were so aghast and agog, and they, they suggested that actually she had faked her suicide and that she would come back and tell the stories of all the wealthy men, you know, the judges and the lawyers and the bankers and the politicians whose daughters and wives and mistresses had used Madame's services all this time. And that she was probably, you know, in Boston or London plying her trade again. And that, you know, that, that the suicide was a fake. And I thought, well, what if it was? That would be a good story. So in my novel, there she doesn't, um, she doesn't kill herself. She lives to tell the tale. Even in the days after Madame Restel's reported suicide, there were questions if it was a hoax to allow her to flee the country. While we will never truly know the truth about the mysterious circumstances of Madame Restel's death, Jennifer argues that there are some suspicious aspects of the story written in the papers. Okay, look, I have spent a lot of time with Madame Restel, so I think I am probably biased in how I look at her. But Madame Restel doesn't usually bow to other people's opinion of her. Um, she is a pretty brazen woman at every step of her life. So it surprised me that Madame Restell immediately after her arrest is very calm. She talks to reporters about how like, yeah, she's catching up on her reading. She got some good sleep in prison. <laughs> um, she's, she's like, she's doing her Restell bits. And then her attitude changes very quickly um, where she becomes very 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 uncharacteristically hysterical um and starts telling people that she is suicidal and that is so unlike her that um one of her other biographies clifford browder says that the only explanation is that she went insane um and she, madame ristel has been in prison before madame ristel when she was in prison before, like, memorably was visited by a Christian moral reform society who tried to give her tracts from the Bible, and she told them that she already had enough novels. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, she's usually pretty unflappable. But we also know that she had told her, by this point, estranged son-in-law, that the family had a plan to get her out of the country. If things were ever going really bad, there was an escape plan for her. She um, talked to a lawyer about how if a body was buried outside of New York City, could it ever be exhumed? Um, and we know that her body was taken to Terrytown very, very quickly. Now, the body that was found in the tub, uh, they did find a body. Nobody could really identify it as Madame Restell other than people in her own family and they were all really close to her um madame ristel had a very very loving very close relationship with her grandson and her granddaughter and we know that after her supposed death um a body was found in the tub with its neck slit her other associates said well like this is a weird way to commit suicide madame ristel would have known that's really hard to slit your own throat um yeah, Madame Marcel would have known less painful ways to commit suicide. She could have taken pills. She had infinite access to them. Afterwards, her we know that all of her jewels and her favorite dresses were gone from the house. And we also know that her grandchildren showed up at the reading of the will, not in mourning attire at all, looking like perfectly happy in like cheerful summer outfits. And for the next decade, they took a three-month trip to Paris every year. And there were reports in the newspaper of other people who had seen her in Paris. Um, some of them said she was still practicing her work. She was just in Paris now. And I... I look, again, this might be because 
for all I think Madame Ristel is a very flawed person, and I don't ever want to paint her as a saint. I read about this woman every day for three years. I fell a little bit in love with her. Maybe I just can't handle the idea that she committed suicide. But I have always liked to believe that she probably got a body from the morgue, dumped it in her bathtub, and got on the next ship that was getting her out of town. Many people disapproved of the aggressive and secretive way Comstock entrapped Madame Ristel. But in the end, very few ever spoke up in her defense. For the moralizing populace, it was hoped that with the end of Madame Ristel's services, society would go back to what it had been before. A place where women obediently served their husbands and had as many children as they possibly could. Here's Jennifer. People didn't like Comstock, though. Um, they, people kind of had to say that they liked Comstock because otherwise, like, what do you have to hide? Why do you love pornography? But um, uh, Comstock was, at least in sophisticated intellectual circles, always a joke. Um, there are uh, some very good political cartoons of Comstock, one where he's approaching a judge and dragging a woman behind him and saying, Your Honor, this woman gave birth to a naked child. <laughs> um Another's of a woman walking down the street and saying, oh no, my shoelaces come undone, but that horrible Anthony Comstock is behind me. What do I do? <laughs> so yeah, Anthony Comstock was always a joke, but he was a very influential joke. So it's not surprising that people said like, oh, this is underhanded on Anthony Comstock's part. But that didn't mean that they were saying that they were in favor of Madame Stone. I think one of the things that people had justification to expect the first time they tried this was uh, that this was going to result in a return to motherhood, that this either suicide or elimination of Madame Ristel would be good for society. There's a cartoon in Puck that, after Madame Ristel's death was announced, says uh, Fifth Avenue five years after Madame Ristel's death, and it's all just mothers pushing baby prams. So... Uh, there was an expectation that like, okay, this is, this is going to like ultimately be good. And during Madame Ristel's time, it was estimated that one in five pregnancies ended in abortion. Uh, Horatio Story thought it was a little higher in New York. He thought it was one in four. And in 1898, 25 years after the passage and enforcement of the Comstock laws, uh, the Michigan Board of Health reported that they thought that one in three pregnancies in their state was terminated by abortion. So abortion didn't end. It didn't even become less common. Um, what started happening was that instead of going to reputable professionals, women just started trying to do it themselves. And because they couldn't even get reliable information on how to do it themselves, they started doing it in incredibly scary, dangerous ways. And I am afraid that is what we are heading back to now. I think it is important to write her out of history. Um, I think you do not want to have this figure around saying like, hey, if you become an abortionist, you can be super rich. Madame Ristel had like extravagant parties that, by the way, were very well attended. It wasn't like an HBO thing of like, oh, she's looked down not socially, even though she's rich. Like everybody showed up, but she wore like diamonds and beautiful dresses and had champagne and everybody had great parties at her house on New Year's Eve. So... <laughs> Um, so I think having that figure out there is very bad if uh, you want to talk about abortion as an incredible evil in society. I mean, I think as the rhetoric changes during this period, she's remembered in a very devilish way. Uh, I think people talk about her being very, very wicked. And people still talk about her in that context today. It's interesting. I wanted to find a nice picture of her for the cover of the book. And you will notice we do not have a smiling picture of Madame Ristel's face. And that's because all of the drawings of her are her like sprouting demon wings and eating a baby. Um, and it's 
so surprising to me because when you read the articles about her, everybody talks about how incredibly beautiful she is. Um, like she's so pretty, she's so charming, she's so well dressed all the time. Um, there's this one very disturbing article by Mordecai Noah talking about how he hates her and, and he's constantly fantasizing about what her breasts would look like in a prison uniform. And it would be cool. Breath, her magnificent breasts wouldn't that be great um, it's it's super weird um but yeah everybody agrees that madame ristel was apparently like a very beautiful buxom woman and it was really sad to me that the only pictures i could find are her like scowling and being arrested however despite their desire abortion continued and continues to be a service women seek out the Comstock Act that would eventually bring Madame Ristel down lasted well into the 20th century, and only ended after another pioneering woman, Margaret Sanger, fought against it. As Jennifer discusses... Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger is the one who really convinced doctors that you should be able to distribute birth control through the mail in cases where... The women's health would be very adversely affected afterwards so it takes a really really long time um yeah um and margaret sanger started pushing back against the comstock act because she had been a nurse and she attended to one patient who gave birth to her third child and it was a very difficult birth and the doctor told her if you have another child you will die and the woman understandably said well my husband isn't going to stop having sex with me what do i do and the doctor waggled his finger at her as though she was a naughty child and walked away without saying anything because he couldn't distribute any information about birth control and, and margaret sanger went back the next year to deliver that woman's fourth child and watch the woman die and afterwards she started writing a column called what every girl should know um upload uh, how to track your cycle, how to practice birth control, what STDs are. And that column was shut down under the Comstock Act. Um, the paper it ran in ran um, a funny headline as it was shut down that said, what every girl should know, nothing by order of the US post office. <laughs> Margaret Sanger was threatened with jail time constantly. Um, one of my interesting favorite facts about her is that she was too busy writing her book on family limitation to prepare a defense for when she was going to trial. <laughs> she, she, she's become such a controversial figure now. And I'm not a Margaret Sanger um, biographer, so I can't really tell you if she was more of a eugenicist than the average person during that period. But I think I can tell you that people who want to keep up every statue of slaveholders don't actually care about that as anything other than a point of rhetoric that they can use to hammer the opponent. For many people in America, it is becoming clear that the world of Madame Ristel may be returning in startling ways. This makes the history of Madame Ristel, abortion, and birth control in America fundamental to our understanding of what the world could look like if we reverted to the 1840s. Kate argues that not only is it important to look at Madame Ristel's life, but to use the past as a way to comprehend the present and to have conversations in a completely polarized American society. When I started writing this book, it was probably 20, 2008. It took me a long time to write it. Um, and I kept thinking, oh, aren't we so lucky that we didn't live, you know, look what our, in that time, look what our foremothers had to go through, look what they put up with, and aren't we so lucky? But as I wrote it, I kept thinking, oh my God, this is coming back. This is, this is happening again. And if we don't watch out, we'll be dragged kicking and screaming to medieval times again. And, and I fear that, you know, if we don't know this history and we don't resist this new onslaught of laws, we, we will, you know, we'll be back where we were in the 1850s. <laughs> I think that that's, that is important. You know, we do know about Margaret Sanger. We know that she helped bring the birth control pill to market. But Madame Restell was a birth control pioneer in this way that we have we don't know about. 
And so, you know, good people can disagree about abortion rights or reproductive rights, but when you do, when you know the history and what you, and when you understand that women have always sought this kind of abortion care, and you know they always will, you you want to make it as safe and available as possible, so that we don't you know go back to the the dark ages. I think the past is an excellent surrogate for the present. If we start to talk now, as I have done, about the present and our political polarization and our back and forth over this issue, it's too heated and too the sides are too ossified. But if you talk, you say, well, this was a long time ago. This happened a long time ago. And this isn't, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about Axie Muldoon and her patients and what happened to her friend, Greta, and what about her daughter, and how she desperately wished to conceive her, to have her own children. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not talking about um, the Congress, I'm talking about Anthony Comstock, you know, so I think it's a much safer conversation for, for people. And when I first began to go around to book clubs and stuff, I, I think I was very, I was much more delicate. I said pregnancy termination. You know, and I would talk to rooms full of women and sometimes a hand would go up and they would say, you know, I had an illegal abortion in 1962 or 1955. And and this was a way to get people to tell stories that they had never told. These were these were secrets. And and I think that sometimes our reticence to talk about this stuff in the past has gotten us in trouble where we are today. And if we know this history, uh, women's history, the wicked women, were they wicked, really? Um, it's hard that, you know, you always see them called witches. And uh, and I think that that's, that's a kind of history that really interests me. And I know it interests you too. I think what fiction can do really well is it, it carries emotion. You, you live inside the life of, a, of a, one or two people and you, you see their relationships and you see their choices along the way and you understand um, why they did things and their feelings about it. And, and you have the texture of life in the past that a history book, you know, they can say in 1852, there was the such and such an act of this, and then Congress passed this. And then, you know, in 1632, Parliament, it's very dry. It's dry. Whereas fiction can be sweeping and dramatic and action-packed or bring that action alive, really. It was very careful to have the the protagonist, Axie Muldoon, talk about the complexities you know, that, that that's what she always, you know, the hand of a midwife, she would say, is, is, is a steady hand. And, and the heart of a midwife is, is, must be large because you have to understand what women are going through and respect each, each woman's story and situation and circumstance and health. So, yeah, I do think that fiction um, can get at, at those nuances it's very difficult to find first person accounts by women of what their lives were like. You know, we, we have letters and it was never considered uh, the domain of serious scholarship. And so we have relied a lot on historical fiction to tell us what our ancestors went through. And, and there's, you know, there are many, many people who, who can't, who can't know their history. When you think about African-American history, who, who can't, people can't trace their ancestry. They don't have a first person account of what the middle passage was like. And so, so to excavate these stories as you're doing um, and, and which I really like to do is, is to use letters and diaries and other people's, you know, reading about Madame Restelle, other people said all these horrible things about her. But if you begin to question the tone and where they came from and their motives and who was doing the writing, then you begin to say, okay, this is a one-sided. So how would it feel if you were Madame in a courtroom and it was you alone surrounded by 
a jury of 12 men and a judge who was a man and a prosecutor who was a man and 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 you're just the only woman standing there in the box with a you know so i think i think that fiction can can convey what that was like for her <laughs> well i i i fear sometimes that in talking about this that it sounds like it's a you know it's a grim um, abortion novel. <laughs> so, so I, so I, you know, I first, I kind of resisted when, when I had this orphan, um, on riding the orphan train and, and I found this, this photograph, I was like, Oh, you know, no, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> but it, the history was so moving and, and fascinating to me. So here you have this scrappy young girl who rests her way up from the streets of Manhattan uh, in, in desperate circumstances and learns this trade and has this attitude and has, you know, finds a family. That's really what it is. It's a search for her search for her family and how she makes that happen. It's a, it's a saga in that way. And it is kind of, it's Dickensian, I think. So when you when you read a Dickens novel, you you see the you see this the the hero the heroine um, fighting uh, fighting her way with a certain kind of attitude and cheer and great sense of humor and so it's an adventure and it's it's a I hope a rip roaring one with some good twists and turns that will keep you turning the pages yeah and I think that you can. If you focus on one person and 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 one life, you the, the 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 specificity brings the whole world alive. So in this very specifics, you find the the general, you find the time period, you find so much about it. So there's just so much evidence that anytime somebody, anytime a woman tries to speak up or become her own person, she gets branded and labeled and and excoriated and run out of town. Jennifer also emphasizes the need to take the lessons of Madame Ristel's life and era to heart and to not get complacent about our rights. I think it's very important to remember that your rights can be taken away from you. I think that there was a lot of complacency that like, oh, they'll never overturn Roe versus Wade. And um, they, they will, they can. Um, there are always going to be people who want to see America as a theocracy run by white Christians. And uh, I think they are really having a great moment as they try to push towards that right now. And you have to fight against that constantly. The fight will never end because I think when you let up on it, and for a long time, I think we let the Overton window be moved very far to the right. Um, I think as anti-abortionists did things like uh, shoot abortionists when they were attending church, we kept talking about how like, oh, I don't believe in late term abortions either. Or like, of course it should be safe and legal and very rare. Um, I don't think we did give it enough pushback of women have to make this decision for themselves. This is a decision you can only make as an individual. Pregnancy is complicated. You have to treat women as though they have full ownership over their bodies. Um, I think we kept trying to be polite for so long that it made it easy for them to win. And I think in the future, we have to push back harder. We have to be less polite. And um, we have to hedge a lot less on which abortions are the okay ones and which are the ones that we don't want because we don't really know what women are going through. And I think that's very important. And uh, I think it's something that hopefully it will not take us a hundred years to overturn this time because it took a hundred years to fully legalize abortion last time so well i do think that one of madame Rostel's greatest failings is that madame Rostel has no female friends um madame Rostel, uh, except for her granddaughter she loves her granddaughter but madame Rostel, um wasn't somebody who really thought of herself as someone who needed to have a collective. Um, there were many other female abortionists 
And she never tries to work with them. There's no moment of like, let's all get together and like, let's figure out how we can improve as professionals. And let's figure out how we can write things for papers that talk about how our work is valuable. She just runs them out of business. Um, she will write articles in the paper, just trashing them until they can't work anymore. And uh, th that makes sense if you are seeing it as a me against the world situation where like my job is to make as much money for my family as possible but Madame Marcel never works with the suffragettes in any capacity uh she doesn't really understand why women need the right to vote because she just bribed politicians so money money is the vote if she just makes enough money and then she gives them all gold watches and it's fine but um Madame Marcel could have gone a lot farther I think we'll never know if there had been collective action if she had worked with other people it's a lot harder to silence a mass of people than it is to silence one person even if that person is very very rich and very successful and I hope we're understanding that more now I hope we I, and I think we do see we see women rising up and fighting for their rights and we're also seeing the abortion is a winning issue at the polls so hopefully things will not be terrible by the time our daughters are adults I hope her legacy will be about the value of being very outspoken about abortion, about the fact that this has always been a part of human society, that it is a very normal part of human society and something that has always been done and something that women have always felt the need for.